time-wise, but we'll talk a little bit about um, design of scientific software. And once again, I'll apologize to um, some of you folks who are more oriented on experimental and observational science. The examples here are going to run towards modeling and simulation type things, but hopefully you can get the, the fundamental takeaway messages in the same way. Um, and so once again, we talk about this uh, virtuous cycle that um, brings us to, uh, a, a, attempts to bring us to a better understanding of science, but gives us more complex software and um, more challenging situations to deal with. Um, and we've been, over time, we've spent a lot of time working on this uh, distributed memory model of computing, where we just added more and more cores and sort of everybody was mostly happy. The platforms weren't getting that much more complex. Um, it required more complex software to deal with this stuff. But then um, we went through this phase change and now we're talking about heterogeneous computing and both the platforms and the software are becoming more complex to deal with those things. So we end up in situations where a lot of different pieces of the software may be actively changing and the subjects of research at, uh, at any given moment, the software is continuously changing and we're, you know, pretty much anything we're trying to do with it is different and unique than the last time we tried to do something because we're always trying to you know, move forward and um, explore different situations, do new things with the software. So here are a few design principles that you might want to think about. First of all, as we've discussed, we work in increasingly multidisciplinary teams. So it's not feasible for one person to know everything about the software system or the domain or, you know, the different uh, types of knowledge that are required excuse me, an approach to deal with that is separation of concerns. So basically this in, in the larger context, this amounts to encapsulating the different aspects of the software system in ways that people, so some people will know and understand the details inside that black, that um, white box, and others will be able to essentially treat it as a black box. They just call with the APIs, which are of course well documented and well tested and um, they don't need to know all the internal details as long as it does what it says it's gonna do. Um, we end up working with different types of code components within our code. Um, there are things that are more infrastructure oriented um, and then there's more sciency aspects. They tend to um, have different considerations. They tend to evolve at different cases and for different reasons. Um, and so it's useful to recognize those distinctions in the way you design and deal with the software. What is longer lasting and what needs to be, you know, um, able to be changed quickly. What's uh, where the complexity lies and, and how you're dealing with it and things like that. And then we also um, have to recognize that codes grow. You have new ideas and you want to implement new features, the code is reused by other people to do things that you hadn't conceived of originally. Um, it has to work on new platforms that it wasn't working on before. So you need to design for extensibility. Even if you don't know what's coming, you, you want to design so that you have the flexibility to adapt easily to what you think might be in store. So make it easy to add new capabilities or to customize them and things like that. And so here's kind of a picture on the left, we see sort of four different parts of the code. There's um, parts of the code that are subjects of the research and there's, um, there's client code, which is sort of using the um, aspects of the uh, uh, system that that tend to be mathematically complex and more experimental in nature. And then down at the bottom, you see um, things that are more stable and more of the infrastructure and things like that. And um, so you wanna try to structure your design so that there are these different things and they're separated from each other. So um, you decompose them into logically separable functional units and you put well-defined inter interfaces around them, you differentiate between the public and the private aspects 
of the code. How, how many people understand what, what I mean by that statement? This is something that's kind of common in object-oriented programming but may not be so familiar in other cases. If you have a piece of code, you know, a, a collection of code, sometimes there'll be methods that are just for internal use and there'll be other methods that are, you know, sort of the outside interface, the, the library, what, what you expose to the outside users as a library or something like that. And you want to make sure that the things that are meant to be private stay private, that people, even if they exist and people can find out about them, you want to discourage them from using them. In some languages, you can effectively prevent them from using them. In other cases, it's harder. But those, the private internal stuff is easier to change because you haven't told anybody else about it. Right, um, and if somebody outside is relying on what is, you know, a private uh, method call or something like that, what should be private, um, then when that breaks due to some change, that's not your problem; it's their problem, right? Um, and so, you know, some some ways of thinking about the design that will help you structure things so that you can um, make these kind of differentiations. And you can make these at multiple levels, right? So you can, you know, just individual units, uh, classes, or, or however you're, you're structuring your code. Um, and you can make them, you know, sort of at component levels or, or assemblies that work together. Um, and, and you can do this at multiple scales. And so basically a workflow is something like this. You have sort of the infrastructure on one side and you have the scientific capabilities that you need on the other side. So you have on the capability side, you have a model of the physics or whatever that you want to implement. And this generates requirements on the infrastructure side, what you need to support that. And you start defining an API, an interface, so that you can separate the model and how that's implemented from the infrastructure. And then you, um, you work on, once you have the requirements for the infrastructure and the API design, then you can work on implementing that and you can implement the, um, the model. And then you, on the infrastructure side especially, testing is really important because that stuff has to just work and be completely reliable for people who don't know anything about it. The infrastructure becomes the black box for the domain scientists typically. Um, and on the other side, the, you, the domain scientists need to validate the model and you need to um, obviously integrate these things, otherwise it won't work. But um, you, you have this um, sort of cycle where these things feed back to each other. You may find that you want to do something new in the model, and that may lead to some new requirements. You may need to augment the infrastructure to support those new requirements. And so you go through these cycles, but this is kind of a picture of what it could look like, basically. And this is just to help get you into a more systematic way of thinking about design. So a lot of folks that I know go into some project and say, oh, it needs to do this. And they start coding up and they have some big collection of code that may do what they want, but it hasn't probably been designed in a thoughtful way so that you can actually evolve it effectively with a technique like this. And if you start with concepts like this, then you, are, uh, you have the possibility to think more uh, about it more systematically as you go along. And so let's just take a very simple example. This is, you, you have a wall with a water pipe in it. Outside it's minus 40 and inside it's nice comfy 70 degrees. And you wanna know if your water pipe is gonna freeze or not. Uh, so we're gonna have just a simple one dimensional heat equation. And we have, we wanna identify here um, how we would divide this up, right? So we have a specification, we have, we wanna solve the heat equation with some initial boundary conditions. And we want to be able to apply different integration methods to see how they work. So the infrastructure is the discretization over that wall, um, the ability to verify I.O. We have to say, you know, what, what the temperature is going to look like over time in the water pipe. We have to apply the initial conditions, um, things like that. And then the model has what are the actual initial conditions, boundary conditions, and um, the integrator, the, the the way we want to integrate the uh, heat equation, right? The algorithm that we're going to use. And so we can define some APIs for the infrastructure side of things. We need to process some arguments. When we get this call, we need to do some initialization. We need to set the initial conditions and things like that. And I don't want you to dwell 
on the actual signatures here or even the, the names of the calls, just that here's some infrastructure, a very simple problem. The infrastructure here is small. Um, then we have some uh, APIs for the model. So we have some different integrators. We're gonna use, we're gonna have the option to do Crank Nicholson or Upland or FTCS. And we also happen to have an exact solution for this problem. And we also need to compute the L2 norm to figure out what, you know, um, how we're doing here. And so this is kind of the model side of things. And we can actually implement those things. To extend it to a, a larger concept, if you're doing in uh, modeling and simulation, especially we do um, a, a lot of physics over maybe one, two or three dimensional domains. And on big computers, we tend to divide those domains up spatially uh, and put different pieces of them on different nodes to parallelize the work. And so we end up with an architecture that says, okay, we have a spatial decomposition. And so we have a way to divide this, uh, this space up that we wanna look at. And um, then within each node, we have some, excuse me, individual workspace where we can apply all the physics we need. And from the decomposition side, we have ways of, you know, sort of exchanging boundary conditions or whatever else it is that we need to know about the rest of the world in which each little square works. And so we have uh, ways of architecting the code. This leads us to ways of architecting the code. So we have these things that work, worry about the distribution and worry about the communication of information between the different elements of the distribution. And then we can implement a lot of the physics so that it's just looking at what's happening on that node with the boundary conditions that have already been applied to it. And so this allows a separation of concern. So on this decomposition side, we're concerned about the parallelization, the, the ability to expose, you know, how much parallelism is in this thing, this decomposition, and to scale that out and to optimize those aspects. And in within each individual thing where we're applying the physics, we are worried about memory access locally and um, making that computation on the node as fast as we can, whether we're using CPUs or GPUs or AI accelerators or whatever. And so we end up with things that can help give us a separation of concerns and allow different people to um, focus on different parts of the code. So we might want the physics to be implemented by domain experts and applied math folks. Um, we might want um, the software engineers and performance engineers to be looking at some of these other aspects, right? So we can divide things out and people can um, work more according to their backgrounds. You can do this in the real world. That's not just um, uh, an arbitrary example. This is an example from the astrophysics code Flash. Now it's called Flash X. They have an approach where they've developed. This is uh, a, a predominantly Fortran code. So it's not uh, it's sort of implementing object orientation and, and componentization and things like that through uh, other what we might call other methods but they have the ability to put together components. It's, it's sort of evolved into a, a framework for uh, complex simulations. They have a lot of different components to do a lot of different types of physics and different environments. It's used, been used in uh, many situations beyond astrophysics as well. Um, and, and so they have a structure to do this. And so like everybody else, they went through all this and um, you know, at the end of the sort of distributed memory, many core kind of era, um, they, they had this model that I've been talking about, differentiate between the slow and the fast changing components of your code, what's the infrastructure, what's the numerics, understand those requirements well, separate the concerns so that you can implement them, um, by have different people working on them and things like that. You should design with portability, extensibility, reproducibility and maintainability in mind. We haven't talked so much about that yet, but we'll get to some of those aspects. Um, and one, in, one thing I haven't talked about, but don't design with a specific programming model in mind. This is a, a key point that we've learned for um, long lived codes being able to continue on different hardware architectures. You're better off getting the, um, the models and um, you know sort of conceptually right at a high level. And then we'll talk about ways that you can um, actually apply different programming models to that in a few minutes. Um, and so now we get into this area of heterogeneous computing and, and the question is, does this cause us to change 
these design principles we've been following? Um, the answer is no, not really, but things get a little more involved. So um, most of the changes that we're gonna find are in two places. Um, one is the APIs. We may have to modify the APIs to be more flexible in the way the physics interacts with the infrastructure. Um, and we also oftentimes have to be more careful when we start integrating things together because the code becomes more complex. Uh, we have to be more careful about when we uh, uh, start bringing it together. There's more opportunities for errors. And so the, the guidance that we've seen based on experience in the Exascale Computing Project and, and in the community at large for performance portability is first of all to design for hierarchical parallelism. So expect that you're gonna have parallelism at multiple levels, design towards thousands of threads, not tens of threads. Uh, expect a hierarchical memory space. If you don't end up on a system with a hierarchical memory space, life gets a little bit easier. But if you try to go the other direction, life can be very hard. Um, you want to pay attention to memory in a way that um, maybe people aren't used to all the time. So you want to include ways of um, managing your memory, figuring out what you're using, have a clear allocation for your, for your memory and the ability to reuse. So people use pools of memory and, and things like that. Um, and this helps manage, especially in a hierarchical sense of where the memory lives and, and what you're doing with it and things like that. Um, and really from the design standpoint, you should avoid exposing or using vendor specific options because those will tend to be not portable. So one big example in, uh, as we've gotten into the area of GPU accelerators is that NVIDIA was sort of the first to market with uh, GPU accelerators for general computing. And they have this CUDA programming environment, which is C++ like, but it's not C++. And um, so a lot of people wanted to get running on GPUs and they put their, uh, they wrote code in CUDA. And now we have um, accelerators from AMD and we have accelerators from Intel and we have others. Uh, and now these people with CUDA code have to find another way to use these other accelerators because CUDA is a proprietary NVIDIA specific language. And so um, this is a bit of a challenge, but we're learning now that we're in this um, multi-vendor environment a little bit better how to deal with those things. Um, I would say it hasn't settled out yet for those who are using GPU accelerators, but um, I have hope that over time we will get better at the uh, portability aspects for that, for example. And that's also something else to realize about the environment that we live in. Things are changing. And if we have long lived software, it's probably gonna outlive changes in hardware platforms and things like that. So um, you want to, as we've said, you want to think about that, even if you don't know the specifics, you wanna think about the flexibility to follow different approaches and try not to embed them in the design, make the, make the specifics for the programming model something that goes over the top. And one way to think about that, so this is another view of that uh, multi-physics PDE style problem. So we have spatial decomposition and then we have the physics down at the sort of the node level. And then things can get more complex in these new environments where you may need to think about um, distributing the load and you may need to think about runtime management of and load balancing and things like that. Um, and you may at the um, sort of the node level, the, the, the physics, you may need to think about uh, having different code that does the physics on different types of processors because uh, to get the most efficiency. So you might have, you, you, you may be able to encode that in one language um, that works everywhere if you're lucky, but in many cases you'll have to maintain variants or you'll have to be able to transform the code in some way so that you can take advantage of the hardware, but you wanna isolate that and, and make those blocks as small as possible. And so you develop these abstraction layers that allow you to, to do that isolation. And then, so to do this, you need to know something about the structure of the code. You need to know how, what algorithms are going to work for you on different devices, better or worse, that often requires experimentation because the results can sometimes be surprising. 
you need to know how the data is moving between the devices and between the different parts of the memory hierarchy and things like that. And then you have the ability to start mapping the computations that you need to do to the appropriate devices and memory um, locations and, and things like that. And then you have to um, build into the abstraction layers the ways to specify those uh, different mappings. And so ultimately, the performance from one uh, hardware architecture to another depends on how well you're able to do that mapping. And so some of the underlying ideas behind this is to make the same code work on different uh, devices. Sometimes the compiler can help you with this. Sometimes you just need to have uh, different ways, different specializations to get, you know, to, to get the, the right code, essentially the right, uh, oftentimes it's the data structures and the order, the, the order of in which you're accessing the data and things like that that will drive the performance. So one example, especially in the C++ world, is things like uh, template metaprogramming. Um, you can do similar things by hook or by crook in other languages, even if they don't have the, the sophistication of C++. Um, and then you want to think about within the node how you're getting the work done. So using parallel four, or you know, if you're using OpenMP, think about um, how to specify the, the appropriate parallelism, where the memory that's associated with those computation lives, make sure it's in the right place. Um, there are an increasing number of systems these days for asynchronous task-based computing, which can be more complex. We're not really gonna talk about that, but that, um, that ups the bar a little bit, but can give you more concurrency. So basically, you need to sort of look at what you need in your code to be able to support these things and try to design for the common elements. Um, and these are, you know, to, to figure out the right abstractions. And then even if you're using some third party tool, maybe Cocos for C++ or, or something like that, you still need to understand the code structure and um, how these abstractions are, what they're meant to do and how they're working to get good performance. It is still important to see, see through those things. Um, and so this all amounts to an investment in the design and the thought process about what's under the covers, not just driving straight to the implementation for a single platform. So some final takeaways. Um, we think that the key to both performance portability ability and longevity of a piece of software is careful design. Um, extensibility should be built into the design. Stay away from encoding any specific programming model into the design um, and think about things like composability and flexibility to help not only with extensibility but also with performance portability. And there's a bunch of resources here that might help you delve into this more deeply for those who are interested. All right, I'm probably pretty far over time. So I'm gonna, if there are a couple of quick questions, we'll take those, but I wanna um, move on to the next presentation quickly. Any questions? Yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, we, this is Maggie again. We do have two questions on Slido. Um, so I'm gonna read those if you're okay, it's two of them. Um, so one from Michael, was wondering if you had any insight into handling balancing performance and good design and their competing trade-offs. For example, well-designed code may be easier to modify but perform worse than the performant version, but the performant version has sustainability maintenance issues for a design view. Yeah, so this is, this is a, a common trade-off that almost anybody has to make. So I think the question is, what are your real goals? Is this, uh, is the software a tool that you want to use for the long term? And can your science afford, or is it something that's more of a throwaway and you really need peak speed um, at, at the instant? Um, and then the question of how much your science is going to suffer if you don't get the absolute peak speed. And in many cases, you know, we we talk about this and I often hear people say, well, you know, I'm willing to give up 10% performance for, you know, certain kinds of convenience and things like that. What is that, what is that threshold for you? Everybody has it, it may be squishy, it's almost certainly squishy, but that's the kind of thing to think about to help make those kinds of decisions. And so 
you know, what is what performance are you giving up by um, taking a more sustainable, more general, more portable approach? Um, and those are things that you can do experiments and figure out uh, and have a kind of a measure for that. And is there a second question? Yes, there is. And this is from Andrew. It's a comment. Uh, recognition of the software engineering and technical advances within modeling is a key focus of concern for the NEMO Ocean Model Consortium for people who are research science but are doing a lot of the core development, their own performance metrics are not publication based. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And that's something that a lot of organizations are increasingly recognizing. How do you how do you value, how do you recognize and value software contributions? It's a conversation we're going through at Oak Ridge. We have had um, RSC groups for about five years now or something like that, for example. Um, and I'm glad to see other organizations, um, we're far from alone in that, by the way, but I'm glad to see other organizations are having those kind of conversations as well. Okay, th thank you. Um, please go ahead. I believe we do have a break at 10.30. Um, yeah. just, okay. So,